Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's the 24th of November, 2022, it's six o'clock in the evening. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mark Schrems to you. I don't think that I need to introduce him very briefly. He's an Austrian lawyer. I'm very proud to say that he's an alumnus of uh, the University mm -hmm. of Vienna. So one of uh, the students that uh, the University of Vienna educated, uh, but he's not world famous for being an Austrian lawyer or an alumnus from uh, University of Vienna. He's world famous because he's the person behind at the moment, two uh, Court of Justice of the European Union cases called Schrems 1 and Schrems 2, which do have a major impact on how we see uh, enforcement and uh, international applicability uh, of European data protection standards worldwide. And the person behind the name in the case is Max Schrems, who did this as an individual. He has a quite long track record now in uh, trying to uh, actively fight for his right to data protection. Um, uh, but he's also here as a representative of an NGO that he co-founded, which is called NOIB, None of Your Business. Uh, that's an NGO sitting also here in Vienna. So if uh, any of you, and I do know that we have some students here today, if any of you has an interest in, in investing time and effort and, uh, and dedication into uh, data protection outside university, that what that would be certainly one of the uh, options uh, to consider. We will also talk about one of the projects of NOIP a little bit later where students are actively uh, searched for at the moment. Max, thank you so much for being here. Uh, let's perhaps start with the most obvious question, which is, since when have you been fighting now for your right to data protection in Europe? And for how long would you expect this fight to last from now onwards? <laughs> hey, um, and welcome and thanks for having me as well. Um, yeah, so I started, I think, like with the first like public cases in 2011, I was interested in, in these issues before. As you mentioned, I was actually at the university at the time and there was an option to be in the US for half a year. And I did that in, in Silicon Valley. It was very low key. I didn't have to have grades. And, and so I had time to kind of uh, play around with stuff I was interested in. Um, I think the bigger question is then how long this is going to last because, um, I mean, as always, like all fundamental rights are usually not, you know, you can't receive them once in your life and you're done, then it's usually an ongoing fight um, to, to defend fundamental rights. But in the privacy sphere, it's, extreme, it's kind of extreme on how little enforcement and how little compliance we have. So I guess it's, it's a topic where we're going to be stuck with for, for a good while. Yeah, so no, no clear year that you want to mention. But let's go back to the to the past. I mean, you said that you started in 2011, which is interesting because this is one year before uh, the Commission proposed uh, GDPR. And I remember very well that when uh, Mrs. Reding, who was then the Vice President of the Commission, presented uh, the first proposal for uh, for GDPR in January 2012. Uh, she she gave reference to you and to your case even twice in this very first presentation, uh, which which obviously makes the question even more interesting because it's now more than ten years later. For how long this cases will last? <laughs> uh, is there any any perspective on this matter? Um, it depends on the cases. Uh, I just updated our internal the, um, case management system today and did mm -hmm. some data importing. And by now we have about 850 cases that are pending all over the place. So um, it, it, it very much depends. For the data transfer cases itself, they started in 2013. Uh, so that was two years later. Um, and for them, we do expect some decisions till this year by the Irish, but we'll, we'll see how, how this progresses. Um, the reality is, is that, that these cases get passed on and on. I mean, the data transfer cases are the best example, maybe. It's now nine years where this complaint that I filed originally in Ireland has seen countless courts, has been to the Court of Justice twice, and, and still two years later, we still don't have a decision in this in this case after the Court of Justice decided. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's a very fundamental um, kind of justice deny, you know, justice delayed is justice denied topic. Um, and we see that not only in our cases, but um, also if you look at a lot of the courts, you see a lot of resistance by, by the judges oftentimes, like um, they try to find reasons to kick out GDPR cases because I guess oftentimes they don't understand what the problem is or um, don't agree with the law or it's too complicated. And, and we see a lot of these cases now end up at the Court of Justice because I guess a lot of the local judiciary as well, in addition to the data protection authorities, 
um, are just overwhelmed with the situation or don't want to deal with it and just forward stuff. And if you read some of these references, they're very basic questions. And sometimes you wonder if it really takes the court of justice to read out the law. Um, so you generally see a very strong kind of PR issue around the GPR. So it's kind of a love it or hate it kind of piece of legislation. Um, and we see that on the one hand, the authorities are not overly quick and keen in doing something that partly is political, that partly is because they don't have the resources. It's very different per country. Um, and then once you go to the judiciary, you also see that there is oftentimes a lot of resistance. Um, mm -hmm. And to probably very basic example is in Austria, you usually should get a decision within six months under the law, and then you can appeal it, and that would be another six months at the Bundesverwaltungsgericht. The reality that we face right now is more one and a half to two years at the authority. And then you talk about another one and a half to two years at the Bundesverwaltungsgericht. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that you have four years or whatever to, for example, get your access to data. When under the GDPR, you should get it instantly and no later, later than one month. And um, that is a bit of a larger issue. Um, and one last thing to probably bring in, it's a very long answer, sorry. But I think one issue that really um, got absolutely under, um, uh, where there's very way too little focus on is general deterrence in the GDPR. Um, there was recently a discussion where um, one of the heads of the Austrian DPA, for example, mentioned the number of, of um, penalties they have versus the number of complaints procedures they have. And you have about 2% of the complaints procedures where you actually have a penalty in the end. Um, so you have a good understanding that for a lot of the um, controllers or for a lot of the companies, it just makes sense to even have a procedure, even negotiate stuff for one or two month, two years in a procedure, then last minute comply and still get away without a fine. And that incentivizes non-compliance and, and also makes the work for the authorities harder and harder because if 99% of the people speed, it's very hard to, you know, um, start catching people and when they speed um, because you just don't know where to start and where to end. Mm -hmm. Perhaps let's come back a little bit with this uh, enforcement issue that you were mentioning in your cases because there is a rather new development. I, uh, I, I didn't check today whether this is uh, authentic, so there is a little bit of a disclaimer here that it might not be authentic, but it was uh, spreading around in on Twitter yesterday. And this is supposed to be a letter from Ursula von der Leyen uh, to members of the European Parliament answering a question which was in how far uh, von der Leyen is concerned about uh, data protection and data protection enforcement in a company uh, called TikTok, uh, who that is, as many of you might know, um, Chinese. And, uh, and, and a lot of uh, the wording that uh, von der Leyen is using in this letter reminds me very much of what you're saying uh, when it comes to the older cases you were referring to here, Max, because what she says here is first, thank you for your letter. Second, um, GDPR is to be applied. Um, and third, uh, I quote now literally, the monitoring and enforcement of compliance with EU data protection rules by companies falls in principle within the competence of national authorities, in particular, independent data protection authorities and courts. The practices of TikTok, including with respect to international data transfers, are the object of several ongoing proceedings. This includes an investigation by the Irish DPA about TikTok's compliance with several GDPR requirements, including as regards data transfers to China and the processing of data of minors and litigation before the Dutch courts, in particular concerning targeted advertising regarding minors and data transfers to China. I trust, she says, I trust that these clarifications help address your concerns. So I'm not a member of the parliament and I don't know what exactly the concerns were, but if they were that there are data transferred, data of children transferred to China on an unbelievable, uh, in an unbelievable size, um, uh, never seen before, I'm not that 100% certain whether the link that uh, a DPA, uh, any particular, the, the Irish DPA will take care of the issue is the most convincing answer one would expect. Am I right? Um, exactly. And we see, um, I mean, we see right now a lot of finger pointing. It's basically the DPA say we don't have the resources. How should we do it? Uh, the local government saying, you know, you usually got a lot of more resources. And actually, if you add the resources of all the DPAs in Europe, they're quite quite substantial. Um, and then politics usually points at them. So it's kind of like everybody's pointing at each other and no one really does stuff. 
and mm-hmm. um, and that is, I think, really for a long while ignored. Like everybody's like, okay, it's going to be next month, next month, next month, and next year to have a decision. But I think by now it's really hard to 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 see that this system would actually work. Um, a good example was the EDPS, so the Data Protection Authority that's in charge of EU institutions only, um, actually had a conference beginning of the year um, on how to really have proper enforcement, which was actually criticized by other colleagues, other DPAs to say, you know, you imply that it doesn't work, but I think it was quite obvious that that's true. Um, and there may be some movement now, there may be um, a regulation kind of below the GDPR that would deal with some of the procedural issues. Um, because the legislation, I like the material legislation is quite okay in the GDPR. Like if I, if I would have written it, it's probably half as long. And a lot of the paperwork requirements would probably not be there. Um, but um, I think generally the law doesn't th- doesn't make sense. The issue is really the enforcement part of it. And mm-hmm. it was interesting. There was a um, for this new kind of framework of how the procedures should work. Um, the EDBB just sent a list of like issues that they are not sure about to the commission to clarify in this new law. And one of them is, for example, if the complainants are even parties in the procedure. So we're now four years in and we don't even know who the parties are in a complaints procedure. Uh, to mm-hmm. give you a very good example, in Austria, we're usually party in Ireland as well. But um, in France or in Sweden, the authorities take the view that if you send a complaint to them, it's not like you're opening a case and you're a party to the case. They see that as more or less a petition to ask them as to be so nice as to probably worry about your fundamental rights. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's quite cynical to say that, you know, the hold of the personal the, that fundamental right for example the right to access um mm. is actually not a party to the procedure about this person's actual rights it's it's quite it's quite astonishing um and we for example litigated that in in sweden against the swedish authorities it's really hard to even get a lawyer to represent you uh because mm. they're usually all conflicted on the other side then if you do we actually won the case it costs a couple thousand euros so an average person is not going to do that we actually wanted it the Swedish um, or the Stockholm Administrative Court, but the um, we were just informed yesterday that the Swedish authority appealed to like the higher court if there is even such something like party rights. So you even like like if you look at the GPR actually being passed 2016, so we're about six years in now, we're still debating the very basic principles of it, um, and a lot of it came out of a very cynical coordination between uh, lobbyists in Brussels. So we had. A lot of these industry lobbies that said, you know, we should really make that more flexible, the law, not be that precise and so on. And now law firms that are paid by exactly the same companies as these lobbies were paid, lobbies were paid are now saying, oh, the law is so unclear. We're really not sure if you should have these rights or the law is so unclear. It should really not be enforced or at least we shouldn't get penalized because we can possibly understand what it really means. Um, and that's quite interesting. I think there's a lot of of lessons to be learned from the GPR on, on how not to do uh, regulations and how a lot of this is very aggressively misused. Um, and that's what we see every day. Yeah, may I ask, Max, so, so first I would be interested in, in your assessment why you think that the material part is okay, that 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 is obviously of interest, uh, but let's start perhaps with the formal part and in particular your criticism on its uh, unclarity and and uh, and all the issues coming with this unclarity by asking you the question what should happen now what would you suggest would you would you suggest a reform of gpr should we should we start from scratch and writing the second part again or would you would you go with uh, this proposal to, to to produce just another legal document now <laughs> to, yeah. on, on top or or on side of gdpr or, or would you trust into the Court of Justice uh, or the ETPB or whoever um, in, in giving the necessary guidance? So what would be your approach on that? So as a purely legal lawyer kind of slash academic thinking person, um, you would obviously have to redraft it and change stuff and, and, and amend it. The, the, the reality is it's a EU law and especially law like that is extremely diplomatic and so they kind of negotiated things couldn't agree and then there's some wording that everybody can live with but it doesn't really say what it is so um that is that is one of the fundamental problems yeah isn't that astonishing that even a person like you who is as i said one of the reasons why this whole thing blew up in 2012 in the size it was blowing up that even a person like you argue 
well, there might be some need for reform in GDPR. Absolutely. Still the only thing that we hear from the commission and everyone involved in this uh, officially stating GDPR is a success story. Uh, there's nothing to change. This is the fundament the whole world learns from. And this is the basis for all the additional developments like DSA, DMA, Data Act, uh, AI Act, you name mm -hmm. it all of them stating that the level playing field they start with is GDPR. Isn't that strange, at least? It's, it's, um, I think it's not understandable if you're not in the Brussels bubble. Um, the reality is they're just terrified to open up the GDPR again because they know that multi-million euros are going to be spent on lobbying, on pushing things around and trying to um, blow 100 holes into the law. And that was somehow somehow managed when the GDPR was originally drafted. There's still holes in the law and there's still problems in the law, but it's it's not like terrible. Um, and there is a, let's say, legitimate worry that this would happen if they would actually just say, oh, let's just, you know, put it all on the table and rethink it. So um, that's the reason I said as an academic or like as a legal thinking person, I would say one thing as a person grounded in political reality, <laughs> there may be a good argument to keep the GDPR as it is uh, and to maybe add stuff around it to, to make it more workable. Um, I don't think in general it's really that hard to, to work with. I think um, the procedural part is a substantial issue. I think if I would draft it in you, there would be two or three classes of companies, like to say there's a large, medium, small size type of company where the small size only have to comply with the core principles, but not with a hundred like record keeping requirements that in reality, no small size company is doing anyways. Um, so I think there is, there is elements there and there is a good argument that it is kind of a kind of the global standard nevertheless. Um, because I usually joke and it's like, I said, it's like the, 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 the least tr problematic privacy law that we have right now. <laughs> and, and which may, you know, if, if we zoom out and say we're at the very beginning of, of this whole privacy debate and the whole digitalization debate, it's a bit like 10 or 20 years into um, industrial revolution to say, okay, we have some workers law. It's, it has the principles in it, but we are probably going to add and change that over the next, you know, decades. Um, I think that's a bit how I personally look at the GDPR. Mm -hmm. But I mean, asking you again, because you said that uh, overall it's okay. Um, I mean, it very much, in my view, it, it very much depends on what what your the threshold is you are assessing this against. Mm. And if one of the thresholds is whether Max Schrems was successful in, 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 in being successful in his complaint and in his interest, be it in 2011, be it in 2013, the success rate is... Small, yeah, but right? that that is and not you necessarily. Are, I mean, you are you are well known for this, right? Yeah. So, uh, and there are there that are is many, really many largely people. not a legislative problem. So I think we have Actually, to. The kind enforcement of... is, in my view, right? Because I mean, people. I mean, it. You are. I mean, be, 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 the, the status quo yeah. is, despite GDPR, someone who is well known for enfor for trying to enforce his her uh, fundamental mm. rights to data protection has not succeeded yet in eleven. Yeah. You, you take it 11 years, nine years, whatsoever. Yeah, but, uh, and okay, you say so, that this is not a legislation <laughs> problem. It's, what it, is it? It is, it, is, it is typically an enforcement problem. And I think we, we just have to sort out stuff. There is the, the material law is provided by the European Union, but at least as mm -hmm. the European Union works so far, um, the executive and the enforcement part of it is done by the member states. And, mm -hmm. and that is a structural fundamental problem of the European Union. I think we, if we can zoom out and think about, I don't know, a hundred other topics where if a member state simply does not enforce the law, um, there are options that you have a, a, a procedure against them and so on, but all of these options are extremely weak, extremely slow and deliberately so. I mean, the member states didn't really give the power to the commission to you know, come on, come in with the European army tomorrow if, if Austria does something wrong. Um, it, it simply, in the end, can be ignored and denied, as we see, like with the whole debates with Hungary, Poland, and so on. Um, mm. So I think there is a fundamental issue in, in that area. Um, mm. And this is amplified in the privacy field with a culture of non-compliance. So we have DPAs that just think it's absolutely normal to negotiate with a violator if they would be so nice as to comply with the law, and then tell you know the public that it's also great that they have actually followed their advice. Like anybody else that is speeding just gets a ticket, and no you know no um, policeman is telling you 
you know, we really had a wonderful conversation that Mr. X shouldn't speed anymore. And I fully trust that he's not going to speed in the future anymore. So there was really no need to have a penalty, even though someone went for 200 kilometers an hour in the in the city center. That's kind of, you know, the equivalent of, of what we do in the GDPR. And I think that this culture did not change with the passing of the GDPR. So the idea of, of the political Brussels was, we're going to have a law, we're going to have proper enforcement, we're going to have big penalties, and all these DPAs are going to use it and go ahead. And the reality is that the DPAs do not use it. They're terrified to use it. Um, and they have a really a culture of not even knowing how to enforce stuff. These people, people that work there oftentimes, it depends extremely on the country. Austria is usually better. Uh, but oftentimes they have never had an enforcement experience. They have no legal training. Um, they, they don't even know how to investigate stuff. So you would, what you would need there is more like a, a, a SWAT unit that the drug cartel investigations before <laughs> to actually go <laughs> into places and actually, you know, question people. I've been in a couple of like these hearings now, or we had like an oral hearing before the Austrian DPA. And, you know, there's someone from Google just flat out lying and the consequence is zero. And there's no investigative team. There's no one saying, okay, but we have evidence here and we got that. It's just like, okay, you tell us if you're comply or not. Um, and that's simply abused by these companies. And I think that's very hard to get back to the GDPR, very hard to regulate in the piece of law. So for example, the law says you shall, you know, issue penalties that are, um, that are strong enough. They don't have to be crazy, but at least send a message. If the DPA simply don't issue a penalty or there's no place to go. There is no, like, I don't have a subjective right that a penalty is issued against someone else. So I can go to court and no one else is going to complain. So <laughs> it's just not done. Yeah, I, I don't know whether the comparison with the speeding ticket is so fair, Max, if I may, uh, because I think the main difference here is that uh, whether or not you, you were above the speed limit or not is relatively clear. And you have a very limited budget and time uh, for for fighting. Um, if so, the facts are clear. The law is yeah. relatively clear, and, uh, and there's no incentive normally for anyone to really get this uh, to be clarified on a very structural level. Whereas on in in GDPR, we have companies uh, which are very good in finding uh, good arguments why GDPR is not that clear. They yeah. have uh, legal departments that are funded, I don't know, a hundred times more than the average DPA. And they have all the instruments in their hands to simply mm. make use of all legal, legally uh, valid and possible uh, ways to, 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 to question things. And I don't know whether, so I, I don't think that that would change if you change the culture in a DPA, right? I think I think it's a mix. So uh, what you're describing is these very high level cases. And that's absolutely true. Um, if you look at, for example, um, the submissions we get from law firms that represent Google or Facebook and so on, they just submit 100 pages each time just to make yeah. it bothersome for everybody else to read um, and to just swamp everybody and 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 drain resources out of authorities. Mm -hmm. um, so that is definitely an issue. But we also see very, you know, normal cases of just, I made an access request, I never got an answer. That's about as simple as speeding. It's just like, there's one month I didn't get an answer, that's mm -hmm. it. And mm -hmm. even there, we don't see that much action or that much um, enforcement. Um, mm -hmm. They rather all use these kind of options to say, oh, let's settle the case, let's have an amicable resolution. And the learning effect is um, you just don't answer access requests fully. And for the one or two percent that actually then go to the DPA, you settle the case and you never get a penalty anyway, and you save money compared to actually properly answering stuff. And we see really companies abusing that and, and even in these very simple situations. And, and I think that is a, um, you know, more what I alluded to when I, when I talked about the speeding ticket and, and a lot of the mm -hmm. daily stuff we see, it's just like, you know, the cookie banner just places cookies before you even agreed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, the cookie banner. I mean, this is also something where where your initiative is very interesting. But let's let's keep that apart for a minute, if I may. So just uh, mm -hmm. let's still stay with GDPR. So if I understand you correctly, what you're saying so far is the material part is okay. I would still be interested in some arguments why you think that this is the case. But let's take it like this again. I, I, again, I, you can probably add a hundred things. Like I'm not saying it's perfect. Yeah. I'm saying okay, it's but roughly speaking, it's okay. <laughs> the formal part has issues, but they are mainly in the in in changing the culture of uh, data protection authorities or other national authorities in enforcing the law. 
And, and there's another issue, which is that the different cultures do not really uh, fit with each other very well, so that we need some kind of additional harmonization in that sector. Would, would that uh, summarize correctly? I, I think that's a fair summary, yeah. Okay. So then my question is, um, again, I mean, one of the, one of the things why, why people talk to you at the moment is, is that on the basis where we stand at the moment, which looks like you are describing it, we have the issue that, of course, all kinds of companies, the big ones and the small ones, are still in the situation that they need to transfer data or that they think that they need to transfer data, which brings us to this issue of uh, equality or equivalency or however you call it, of data protection level elsewhere in the world. Um, and and my first question, which is a very naive one, is is if your assessment is correct, where we stand in Europe at the moment, are we then really in the situation and in the position to argue that other areas of the world should please behave in the same <laughs> way before we are allowed to send them data? Um, so on a political level, it's a very fair argument. The U.S. makes that also in a broader um, argument that they say, you know, there are certain member states that also have very vast surveillance apparatuses. And, mm -hmm. and how about them? Um, at the same time, like the argument of someone else, you know, violated the law, too, is, is, is not overly helpful in the procedure. So I think mm -hmm. um, on a political level, it's a very fair argument that it's it's hard to um you know say other for example other uh, countries have a dpa that's not functioning so we can have adequacy with them when in our, our own dpas or data protection authorities are oftentimes not working and i think that that is a relevant uh point to make um mm. and yeah i think that that's that um in relation to the us it's a bit let's say i think it needs to be nuanced a bit more because the First of all, the data that the U.S. in general as a country holds versus any other country in the world is just it's just vast and enormous. Um, so even if there's like surveillance laws in Sweden or France or in Germany that are that are very problematic, um, the reality is that most of our data is not visited, is not hosted with a company in France, Sweden or Germany usually. Not, sorry, um, not true for China anymore when you look into people below 20. Yeah, and, and China is, is a very... Top. Exactly. Uh, China is a really interesting one. Um, at the same time, China doesn't have an adequacy status. So there is also a difference between what the U.S. wants, at least in these negotiations, um, and 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 what the, the, the China argument and how far that goes. Again, it's an enforcement issue. I don't think that right now you could transfer data to China like TikTok does. Um, so I think there there is a there is a good um, case to be to be made and the enforcement to be done there. Mm -hmm. um, Separate from that, I think it's, um, I mean, we can probably go a bit into the U.S. situation specifically, um, but I think it's a quite an interesting scenario that we have. And I think to to enter the discussion on that, what's really going to be mind-blowing the next probably decades is, is how we will deal with um, conflict of law situations online in general. So I think this privacy cases is probably even not that much of a conflict situation because we kind of agree on at least in the democratic countries that there should be some judicial oversight and and some probable cause for wiretapping we don't agree if this also applies to foreigners or only to our own people that's more the problem that we have with the us but we generally agree that government can just not go into everything that's mm. you know with a lot of nuance but but the general principle it's going to be much harder with with uh, authoritarian um, uh, countries and countries that have very different um, legal systems and, and ideas of democracy. Now, the really interesting part is we talk about this in privacy, but we'll, we could have similar discussions or issues in freedom of speech because let's, my standard example is in Austria, there's Holocaust denial being a crime, while in the US that would be freedom of speech. And it's going to be very interesting if we're dem democratic countries where democracies will and cultures are different and therefore democratic processes will lead to different results how we reconcile that at least among you know democratic western whatever you want to call it countries so i think that is a a really interesting space to to think about and and we're just having the first discussions now with privacy but you could probably fill in 100 other rights and you would get similar issues 
Yeah, let us talk a little bit more about the U.S. specific situation at the moment. You you know probably much better than I do that we are still. I mean, nobody really knows, but you know probably more than I do about the status of this uh, third attempt now to to bring uh, the U.S. Um, in on a level of data protection which is to be seen as being equivalent. You were very directly involved in the first two attempts and in in in, in declare getting them declared war. Um, I have two questions now on the third attempt. So actually three questions on the third attempt. The first one is an update, if you can share with me wh wh where you think that we stand at the moment. The second one is whether you don't think that this whole uh, debate with the US uh, misses the point for arguments given already, which is it's not just a US problem, it's a global problem that Europe is not very good in enforcing their fundamental rights internally and still at the same time tries to expand uh, their idea of uh, data protection also to companies who who do not necessarily have a resident or something or, yeah. or a, any place of business in, the, in within Europe. So that is a rather fundamental question. And the third question would then be, what what do we have to expect from from Max Schrems as an individual or from Neub um, as as an organization um, as a consequence from the first two um, um, estimations when it comes to this third attempt? Yeah, so uh, status on the first one, and I hope I, I remember all the three until the end. Um, oh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the status on the first one is so uh, the US has now passed a executive order that's kind of an internal document of the part of the president that basically tells all the executive what to do and not to do. It doesn't mm. have third party rights. So it's not like a law that that like, you can sue under. It's more like an internal document telling anybody within the executive to to please do or not do something. Um, mm -hmm. And it has internally what they call the force of law because it's like an order that you get from your boss where you have to follow it because there is a, in German, you would say Weisungsrecht. Mm -hmm. um, and the whole thing is um, not overly new. Most of it is very much similar to an old executive order that's called PPD 28. Um, in the new executive order, there's, I think, two elements that are really worthwhile debating. Um, the first one is that um, there is a so-called proportionality, necessary and proportionality kind of wording in the new executive order. Um, and the background is that the Court of Justice found US law not to be proportionate under the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So there's the proportionality test under 50, on the Article 52 of the Charter. They applied it and came to the conclusion that the US law is not, um, that the infringements of your right to privacy and your right to redress are not proportionate as they are in the US law. That's kind of in line with the Court of Justice rulings in general, if you look at data retention and, and similar cases within Europe, where the Court of Justice was also very aggressive on, on that or very strict on that. Mm -hmm. um, now, what they did is they added the word proportionate in US law. So on the European side, they will know so now say, woohoo, it's all proportionate because the word is proportionate is there. On the US side, they've already said they're not going to stop these surveillance systems that were found to be not proportionate. So what they basically do is that they, again, a very diplomatic solution, they use the same word, but then have different meanings on two sides. So we're basically going to have um, this play out of the courts, I guess. And mm -hmm. um, it's super interesting because in the old PPD 28, they already said that there is under US law, some other wording, which is equivalent to our proportionality test. And that was also done by the Court of Justice. So I think that is um, interesting because they're going to have words versus reality is going to be the discussion here. The mm -hmm. second part that they have is a redress mechanism. So the redress mechanism um, is necessary to comply with Article 47 of the Charter. So you're right to judicial redress. Um, and the problem is that in these surveillance spheres, there is usually very limited redress because of um, the general argument that all of that is national security, the general argument that all of that needs to be confidential, and therefore um, judicial redress is, is not really you know, working well here. Um, I think there is an argument for that, but it has to pass the proportionality test just as well. So you can say, you know, in individual cases, there is a reason why the surveillance system that you have needs to be confidential and therefore you have to limit your options before a court or a tribunal. Um, what the US right now does is a total black box. So no matter if there is any kind of co uh, conflict, if there is any problem, even if it would be open intelligence, whatever, you would always only be able to raise your issue with your national data protection authority. So for example, the DSB in Austria, they would then refer it to um, a US entity uh, within the justice minister, ministry. That entity would then investigate stuff or not, or do something, you don't know that. 
Um, mm -hmm. And whatever your pr problem is, no matter if you were under surveillance, not under surveillance, if there was a breach of the law, no breach of the law, if your complaint was not even qualifying for uh, procedural reasons, in any case, you would always get exactly the same answer. So you have a rubber stamp answer that is literally pre-described in the executive order of what that par party has to send back. Um, and that is a very, very extreme type of like limiting your Article 47 rights. It basically means that you know your judgment before you even send the, the lawsuit. Um, and I'm not sure if that's going to pass at the Court of Justice because it's going to be very hard to say why such an extreme approach is, is absolutely necessary. Now, the U.S. says that because that's the first step, there's going to be a so-called court as a second step. I think the most more accurate word for it would be a tribunal. Um, but they used the word court because they wanted to have judicial redress. Um, and that is going to be exactly the same system. You've got to get exactly the same answer. Even the wording of the answer is going to be the same as in the first instance, so to say. Um, just with the difference that there's going to be um, five, I think, independent people that are going to be judges in in, in like mm -hmm. a not full judges sense. Um, and they are part of the executive. The idea is that they do not fall under any kind of orders while acting there and therefore would have somewhat of an independence. Uh, mm -hmm. Long story short, you still have the issue that you're not going to be um, in this courtroom. You're not going to have any kind of evidence. You're not going to be able to rebut anything. And you will always get the standard answer. And I wonder if that, again, in the proportionality test, is not way overdoing the the confidentiality that's in, in certain cases is, is legitimate, but but maybe not to that extent here. Mm -hmm. So I think that is the two main reasons. There's other reasons why, if this goes back to the court of justice, there is a legitimate chance that it would not stand the test of the of the court. Um, adding one last thing is it's also a matter of the justices to, you know feel that they're taken seriously. Like if you invalidate two deals in a row and you say, you know, it's a violation of the essence of a fundamental right and so on, and they come back with a bit, bit you know, a slight upgrade, but not any kind of material change. Mm. As a court, you also probably have to be very specific if, if and, and very clear on, on how you look at an approach like that. Um, yeah. I think that's that's kind of generally my, my feeling around it. And your last um, question. No, no, no. There are two missing. Yeah. But before that, one yeah. last question on this first question, which <laughs> is, do you, do you have any update about what the commission is saying or whether any? Yeah, so the commission is definitely going to be happy. The commission is going to issue a no draft. Um, okay. No, they, they're going to say it's all great. It's all wonderful. They're going to issue a draft um, adequacy decision that then has to go before the EDPD, the European Data Protection Board, with all the authorities. The authorities are going to say, we have very serious concerns, but uh, <laughs> same diplomatic blah, blah. And uh, because some DPAs will say it's invalid and, and cannot ever go forward, and the other DPAs will say, no, it should. And because they're not going to agree on anything, they will have some diplomatic wording that will come out of them, is my personal guess. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then this whole thing has to go before the council as well, but the council usually agrees on all of these things anyways. And then we have a final decision, which then can be um, attacked and validated by the Court of Justice. That's kind yeah. of probably the next steps. Okay, so and then the, the the two questions that I still had was the first one was whether we are not missing the point here because yeah. uh, we are so much focusing on the U.S. Um, and and the other question was then what would be your consequence of this of this? So what will you do and what will Noip do and what will yeah. any other player do um, as you see it at the moment? Yeah. So first of all, um, on the U.S. So I think it's still the biggest topic in the sense of it's 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 definitely the place where most of our data goes right now. Like mm -hmm. if you if you zoom out, you know, we have TikTok and we have individual stuff. But I can tell you at Noib, at anything that we get in our inbox, you literally 90 plus percent of data transfers to the U.S. if it comes to data transfers. So it's just mm -hmm. like still the big bulk of data that goes somewhere. And it's the only country where, I've where we have discussions if, if they should be adequate or not. There are other countries where you can debate it as well. Israel is usually mentioned oftentimes, uh, but it's we literally never have had a data transfer to Israel on our table. So like having limited capacities, um, the US is usually the one where, where it does, mm -hmm. does make a lot of sense. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't become more complex in the future or things change in the future. And, and these issues and also the, the judgments by the Court of Justice would not, not have to be applied to China or any other country just as well. So mm -hmm. I think that's the reality is we right now have five lawyers, so you have to think about where you're going to invest your time and your donated money. Mm -hmm. um, so I think uh, I'm not sure if we're missing the point. I think we're we're missing the main point, but there are other points around. Let's, uh, that's mm -hmm. how I would personally uh, see it. 
Um, and on what we do, so we're basically planning to uh, have litigation on that, but have it in a very speedy way. Um, so far, the first case, were, or the second case especially, was brought in Ireland with a very slow and very expensive legal system. So it took about four years to get to the Court of Justice and cost about 10 million euros, just to give you an idea of how much this actually costs. Um, and for example, in Austria, like a civil injunction would be much quicker and usually get you up there much, much faster. Um, mm -hmm. And that's more what we're looking into right now. Okay, so the Austrian <laughs> judicial system can prepare themselves. Good. Great. There's one comment from the audience which says, uh, which asks the following: What does Max say to the fact that the person to represent the data subject in front of the Data Protection Review Court will be chosen by the court itself? Yeah. So there is this idea of an advocate and. Um, to be honest, we have to see how this process would even look like in reality. The law doesn't spell it out in detail. So um, it's, again, the, the one side says better than nothing, but the other side is like, it, it doesn't have any kind of uh, client privileges. It's not allowed to talk to you. It, it's not a representative. It's like saying, you know, um, some Joe from the street is here by representing everybody and then no one elected Joe to do that. Um, and, and I think that's basically what we're seeing here. Um, I think a lot of that is a bit of a camouflage. So to say there, there is someone in there that would advocate for you, but because you're not allowed to see the documents, you're not allowed to in the hearing, you're not allowed to see the judgment other than this like rubber stamp. It's very hard to, to understand if this actually makes any material, has any material impact to, to be honest. I think it's yeah. more, they tried to do a list of what, what elements can we add that could please the court of justice without mm -hmm. really changing anything in the system. And I think that is kind of what, what the result, what's the result that we're seeing. Um, I, I hope see. that's useful. Yeah, I see, Max. I would like, if I may, close uh, this uh, this chapter on enforcement with one last question leading back to what we uh, discussed before, which is the material scope. So um, if, I, if I asked you to give me three main points, which in your view are a clear progress of GDPR when it comes to the material part, in comparison with the data protection environment that we had before 2012 or 16 or 18, mm -hmm. what would that three points be? So what is the progress that you're seeing? So just to be clear, um, the, the progress that I would mainly see is the penalties and the enforcement part of it, even though it's not functioning. So I think that was the real okay. difference. Um, the, the material law that I think is generally good is back to the principles of article five and six that mm -hmm. exist, however, since the 80s. So they weren't changed. And that was oftentimes Rich. interesting because stuff like, yeah, you need consent if you don't have any other legal basis it is not new. But I think a lot of people realized the first time with the GDPR coming in. So yeah. I, yeah. I don't think that the, and that's the reason why I like this core part of it, I, I support I because okay. it does make sense and kind of like it worked somewhat well for, for the last 40 years. Um, so why why do away with it? That's a bit Okay, hard. so the core part that you like is somewhere from the 70s or 80s. It's not, uh, it's <laughs> not so much some of the inventions such as Article 20, Article 22, or even- Yeah, Article so I think a lot of them were, were um, the best example for all of that is the right to be forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. It's the good old right to deletion just mm -hmm. politics wanted to have a name on top of it that was right to be forgotten. And we changed the name three times and disagreed if, if it should be there. Now it's like a sub sub headline, yeah. but it allowed Reading to go out there and say, in Europe, you're going to have a right to be forgotten. And people think that they can just walk anywhere and say, hey, I want you to, to forget me and delete my data. But if you actually read the article, it says only if the data was actually illegally processed, it has to be deleted, which like is like a duh. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, for example, an article we never use in litigation, really, because it doesn't really make any difference. In, in, yeah. yeah. And I think it's a very obscure article, by the way. So the longer I think about Article 17, the less I understand it. And, and it, already <laughs> starts, it already starts with the headline, because for a reason that I don't understand, the right to be forgotten is put into quotation marks there. Yeah. And nobody could ever explain me. And, and that was purely political. I can explain that part to you. So they yeah, definitely, the, the commission yeah. wanted to have the right to be forgotten in there because it was part of their PR strategy around GDPR. And then yeah. the council and the parliament pushed back and said, you know, it's just the old right to deletion and they didn't want the right to be forgotten because it was always connected to this Google de-indexing idea. Um, yeah. And the diplomatic solution was to write, I think it's now erasure on top of it and then in parentheses the forgotten uh, in brackets. So, yeah, um, and that is how a lot of this stuff ended up. It's just like, it doesn't make sense. It's just like, yeah. 
some yeah. some something but, everybody could live with. But the funny thing, if I may share this with you, Max, the funny thing here is it's not in brackets; it's in quotation marks. Yeah. You see it? Uh, so well, <laughs> perhaps yeah. it's the commission being quoted here. I don't know. So whatever. <laughs> yeah. okay. But it's not that what you like so much. It's more about the principles. No, I think that is, that is a perfect okay. example of, of how some yeah. of this just became very political and not really. Yeah. I think, I mean, they should have given these political guidelines and then just put down five or 10 or whatever good lawyers that really know how to draft the law, which is a mm -hmm. extremely complicated task, and then have the political input put into a proper structure. Yeah. And, and that was just not done. It's generally not done in the European Union. Yeah. Max, one of the actions that you were taking recently, although it's already quite some time now, it's not that recent any longer, is it that you, that you or your organization now again take action somewhere, <laughs> not necessarily uh, perhaps in the way as it was foreseen um, at the beginning, uh, which is all this cookie banner problem uh, that all of us know so well, which is that when, wherever you go, the first thing that you see is that you see a lot of mm -hmm. stupid pop-ups uh, coming. Um, and, and, and your organization is, is taking a very interesting approach on this. Could you briefly elaborate what this is and why you are doing this and where you, yeah. where you stand with this? So why we're doing it is uh, basically the following. So um, what's super interesting, I think people interact with the GDPR 99% in an environment that's, that's drafted by companies. And that gives you these terrible banners that make no sense, that just pester everybody, just so that people just click agree and say goodbye. And we looked at a lot of industry, uh, industry numbers, and they usually say they get more than 90% consent rate, even though their own statistics say that only about 3% actually want to consent. There's a lot of like you know dark patterns, design choices that go into it. They call this whole thing um, consent optimization. So it's like a give up your right optimization <laughs> if you if you reframe it. Um, and that works really well for them, and we wanted to go after that. Um, the problem there is you have thousands of websites, and where do you start? And you know, even if you win against one website, um, the others are still not going to change it. So we thought we're going to need some kind of like mass enforcement. Again, coming back to the speeding topic, that is one of these things where you could say, okay, it's a rather simple, uniform violation. Um, so we thought a bit like how speeding cameras work. So an automated kind of um, measuring of the speed, then that there is a evidence taken in the picture, and then you basically extract the um, the license plate number to actually figure out who the owner or the holder of the car is. Um, and that is kind of what we built digitally. We built kind of a, a, web, a web system that can um, investigate websites and find violations and automatically produce complaints. What we did then on top of it, realizing the law of the cases get settled before the DPAs, is that we actually sent these draft complaints to the controllers before actually filing them giving them two months to comply and have like a platform where they can say, okay, I actually agree with you. Um, I changed it. Um, and that included also a guideline on how to change the settings and so on. So if you want it as a controller, you could change it in five to 10 minutes. Um, and whoever disagreed with our view that that was then taken on to the DPA for a decision. Um, and that worked extremely well. We had about 40% compliance rate um, within a two month period before it even went to the authorities. Mm -hmm. And now, where, where are you now with all these cases? Um, yeah, so they trickle around. Um, and, um, and usually these cases, as I said, a lot of them across country, so they take um, easily a year or two. Um, mm. However, even once they go to the authorities, a very large amount of them get settled because uh, uh, companies just comply. Um, the EDPD started to do a task force in it to coordinate all of this. Um, and what we would have hoped for is clear guidance from the EDBB on how cookie banners should look like, because it's the, probably the, the one situation where people interact with the GDPR the most in, in daily lives. Um, and there are guidelines across the member states. So um, we basically followed, we kind of did a, a mix of the, of the guidelines from different member states. Um, but there is not a uniform European list of what's the do's and don'ts um, under the law for cookie banners. Mm. And, and that is a bit of our hope that we get that out of this litigation. Um, what we saw already is that when we did our second scan, that we had a huge spillover effect. So th literally thousands of websites that we have never contacted have actually changed their setup to have like yes or no option, for example, mm. um, that um, without actually direct contact. And that is exactly what I mentioned before, this feeling of general deterrence, of general enforcement that companies out of their own motion comply, just like we all kind of generally comply with the law because we just feel we should. 
Um, and that oftentimes comes from the real realization that if you speed constantly, you're going to get a ticket here and there. Um, mm -hmm. And that may make people to kind of limit how far they, they, they break the law. Um, and that worked really well. And we're working on the software and develop it further for other purposes, not just for cookie banners, but uh, tracking pixels, stuff like that. Okay, but coming back to the cookie banner um, issue, wouldn't you agree with me that that this is also in a way a little bit missing the point? Because me as a data subject, I'm not so, I mean, of course, I'm interested that I have the right uh, not to agree <laughs> with the cookies <laughs> to be put on my machine. That's important, but it would be even more convenient if I could simply ask my browser to put this yes. into my settings and not yeah. bothering me in on every single yeah. website. So my main interest is of not being bothered. Uh, I mean, every day I spend, I don't know, 15 min minutes of my lifetime in, in <laughs> still on in clicking around on cookie banners. So is this not, again, a good example for the priorities are somewhere else? Um, yeah, so we do have a project that's called ATPC for example, exactly the signaling. That's kind of mm -hmm. a signal of how your browser could communicate that to um, the website. The problem right now is there is right now no legal obligation that you have to accept such a signal and you would have to have the signaling in the background to, to actually make sense. Um, that would the idea to... is 25 years old. I remember exactly. that. Exactly, it's do not track and there were, there were cases before. I think, yeah. right? So it's 25 years, yeah. And the GDPR actually foresees that even in Article 21 where it says that there should be a signal like that, but the problem is it doesn't have a mechanism to assign which signal is the right one. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of solving this issue halfway, saying, yes, you should be able to use a signal, but then no one defines the signal. And as a company, I can say, you know, if you send me something random in, in your metadata, why would mm -hmm. I have to comply with this? So what we need in this is, is kind of the approach that they do in California with the um, uh, GPC, I think it's, a, it's the acronym. Um, mm -hmm. So you basically define by law that a certain signal and the header, so basically your browser and the website uh, and the website usually have header information that goes back and mm -hmm. forth, which for example is which browser you're using, the language settings you have and so on. And, and in these settings, you could add a line that basically um, tells your privacy preferences. Um, mm -hmm. And that would make a lot of sense. It would have to go into um, e-privacy and e-privacy is right now stalled because the member states and the commission and parliament cannot agree mainly on, um, on data retention. So Since the law where this was meant to go in. Or something, so again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, So, um, but the problem is from a litigation perspective, it's really hard for us to litigate that. We did mm -hmm. have, a, have an approach, we did have an idea of how we could actually litigate the signal in, but that was a bit, um, let's say, Brechstangen version mm -hmm. of how to get this in. Um, and there are options, uh, because right now our argument is the GDPR doesn't foresee the the way of interaction, like the the, the, the format that you use for, for interaction. So you generally have form Freiheit in German, you can mm -hmm. choose to send a letter or an email or a phone call or you know use the online forum. Um, and one option would be to have um, a signal, and if people do not accept the signal, that you fall back to um, you know letters and anything else that is so complicated for the controller, so that it would rather use the signal. But that is a very kind of brute force approach of of pushing a signal through, and, yeah. and would require a lot of people to participate in kind of ground, let's say, crowd bombardment to to actually get this done. Um, and there is, uh, you know, there is not the, it's not the most likely thing to succeed quickly either. Yeah, it does so, make more sense to have that in litigation uh, in, 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 in the law than litigation. Yeah. So if I understand your position correctly on this, Max, I would say that Neub sees themselves more as as a kind of enforcement agency by litigation and not so much as a policymaker. Yeah. Or, or or NGO trying to influence uh, the the development of the law. Is Absolutely. There are NGOs that do that. So we're a member of EDRI. EDRI is kind of the network of the European digital rights organizations, and they're based in Brussels. The other ones that are very active here is, for example, Access Now. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a very, so what we said is right now we have the situation where we do have law and you know, everything we debated today, there's definitely rooms for improvement, but there are people already in Brussels that work on that from an NGO perspective. Mm -hmm. They're usually outnumbered one to a hundred in, in the lobbying circles, uh, but at least there's someone mm -hmm. around there and there's no need for an additional NGO to do that on top of everybody doing it. What mm -hmm. we didn't have so far is actual enforcement in this sphere. And I think that is kind of why we started Noib as, as an organization more, mm -hmm. I see it more as like a consumer rights organization for, for like, right now data protection, but maybe other digital rights in the future. 
um, yeah. where, where the average guy is probably going to be um, pissed about stuff, but is not going to litigate that. And you usually mm -hmm. need organizations to take that over. And that's more our role is not to influence the law, but to take the law we already have and make sure that that's somehow complied with. Yeah, so it's in a way similar to the Austin Verein für, für, für Konsumenteninformationen, exactly. uh, but for, for digital and for data protection then. Exactly, and on a European level. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So then last question from my side, Max, uh, would be how could, I mean, one of the preconditions to enforce things is to know about cases and what's mm -hmm. going on in the different member states. And you do have an instrument on this, which is, uh, trying to monitor um, uh, the, the relevant case law in the different uh, member states. Uh, it's called GDPR Hub. Um, and perhaps give me a short, give us a short overview about what this is, why you're doing it, and in particular how students or whoever has the time and the interest for this could contribute. Yeah, so it's actually grew out of our own needs. So we wanted to know what authorities are actually deciding across the European Union. And then you have to problem, especially of language. So it's really hard to figure out, you know, what the Icelandic authority has decided. Um, so we tried to collect cases for ourselves um, and thought if we already do that, we'd rather just want to do it in an open wiki and as an open source project so that anybody else in the world uh, can, can get these summaries. And out of that um, grew like a newsletter, which is called T GDPR Today. Um, where each week we get basically send out the newest decisions to, uh, I think right now, about more than 7,000 um, subscribers, which is a rather large number for a very specific newsletter. Um, and the hub itself um, allows you to actually search and find all of these decisions as well. So we now have a power search, as, you, as we call it, um, or advanced search, where you can actually say any decision under Article 6.1 F um, by this and that authority or in this and that jurisdiction or all over Europe that was upheld, turned down, where there was a fine, any combination like that. And what you'll find is a short summary of the case, um, the facts of the holding, and then there is an automated English translation of the full text. Um, and that is actually quite, um, quite useful for research. Now, the reality is you need to um, manually type all of that stuff in. And that is where we rely on what we call country reporters. So we have a network of more than 100 and, and let's say 20 or 30 really active country reporters that um, just basically each week get a case assigned, um, do the summary, send it back into the system, upload it. Um, there is a form to fill out basically for, for each case. And that is what's then in the newsletter the next week uh, with also a name recognition to say with the support of um, Peter or uh, Cecilio, whatever the name is. Um, so that people also get some credit for, for the work there. Um, and it's mainly for the community and it's meant to be very neutral. So as Neub, we're obviously having a political agenda, um, while GDPR is meant to be a academic neutral place of just saying that's the facts of, of what an authority has decided, um, independent of, of what the viewpoints are. Okay, and you are looking for students trying to to participate or wishing to participate in this. Um, exactly. So it's I think it's a great opportunity. Also, a lot of our trainees do that, that they do these summaries, and it really kind of trains your eyes for what's relevant in the case. How do I process a lot of information in short time um, to also get a feeling of how on the ground these cases are decided in the GDPR. A lot of the GDPR is still very theoretical and very much like paperwork that someone does in an office. Um, and I think on, on these elements, it's actually quite interesting. Uh, the other thing is it's just also English legal writing, just to be short, precise, all of these things that, that are really useful in law. And what we do is that for each summary, there is also feedback where we, we adapt it and change it to kind of follow our style guides and, and the requirements. And people also get feedback on that to improve the next time around. And if they do 10 or 20 summaries, there's also like little gifts you get and stuff like that to uh, keep everybody happy and, and appreciate the work. Fine. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Max. I really appreciate it. Uh, and I really liked this hour of your time. Um, it was most interesting as usual. Um, I'm very much looking forward to the further developments that will hopefully bring us together very soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this. Uh, if any Thanks of so. the students has an interest in joining this, I may again recommend this very warmly. I think it's a very, very good way to practice what you are th theoretically learning. Uh, in in one in a world known institution with a lot of reputation, which is useful for you personally, but also for the big thing, which is here better knowledge on GDPR and its applications worldwide, open access, open source. Um, so please consider this. 
Thank you, Max, again. I'm very much looking forward to you. My students, please, we meet in five minutes in the Zoom room on Moodle. Take care until then. See you all. Take care. All the best. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.